белому дал городе у мурами, дал тому селида Карачаеви. Эй, то то не сырый дуб к земли нагинается, ой, то добрый молодец Илья Муромец, батьку матери уклоняется. Далеку дорогу выбирается. Благослови батьку да мати рідня, я у славен город Київ зіздити. Сонячку стольно-київському князю Володимиру служити, віри християнської та богоронити. На доброго коня сідав, у чисте поле в'їжджав, озера ріки перепригав, ліс ламав, під город, під Чернигів під'їжджав. My name is Virlana Tkach, and I direct uh, Yara Arts Group from uh, La Mama Experimental Theater in New York. We continue our virtual series on the Ukraine, uh, for the Ukrainian Museum on Zinovi Stokoko, a virtuoso bandura player in New York in the 1960s. Uh, today, we will look at Stokoko as a singer of tales and his version of stories about medieval Ki uh, Kiev. At the top of our show, you heard the beginning of his masterful Ilya Muromets. Ilya, the mighty warrior, takes leave of his parents and sets off to Kiev to serve Prince Volodymyr, the bright sun. Uh, you'll hear more from this Stokoko recording and our and I'll talk about epics and narrative poems and folk tales. Then uh, Master Bandura player Julian Kitasti will give us some insight into Stokoko's version of Illa Muromets. We have a special guest, Marco Robert Stech from the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies in Toronto and a little surprise video for you from Ukraine at the end. Dobry vecher. Um, я Вірляна Ткач, художній керівник яр мистецької групи в українській дільниці Нью-Йорку. Сьогодні почуємо записи Белін Зиновія Штокалка з 60-х років у Нью-Йорку. Тоді поговоримо з бандуристом Юліаном Кітастим про Штокалка та його Белину та з Робертом Стехом з Канади. If you'd like a program with a list of music in everyone's bios, you can download it from our website. Uh, www.yaraartsgroup.net is that at the end of our show. Uh, our event is bilingual. Everyone will speak their own language and sometimes we summarize in translation. Nash večer dvomoni, majemo programko, ale tiki po angliške, і ку можна а, надрукуватися з нашої веб-сторінки. У нас маленький ритуал, почаємо кожну подію тінку. We have a ritual to start the show. Welcome to Yara Arts Group, dedicated to theater and all the poetry, music, and images that inspire it. Today, Yara is not at La Mama, but in virtual space. Вітаємо. <laughs> Now we'll hear another uh, selection, a section of Stokoko's Ilya Muromets. After leaving home, Ilya is, had rescued Chernihiv from a siege. The townspeople thank him and invite him to stay. Ilya refuses. And now he wants to know the way to Kiev. The Chernihiv folks tell him that um, there's a straight road to Kiev, but it hasn't been used for 30, 30 years. It's because Solovy, the monstrous bandit, 
with a devastating whistle. Oi toto priamado roha, u slaven horot kiu zamuraulema. Zaroslado roha li same brinskime. Уже тридцять літ простою дорогою у Київ город не їжджено. Сидить соловий розбійник на семи дубах. Сидить тридцять літ. Ні кінному, ні пішому пропуску немає. Як засвище соловій по соловійному, Як закричить свірюка по свірину, Як зашипить гад по змії, Так усі трави мурави в ями, Усі квіти обсипаються. А хто близько з людей, так всі мертві лежать. Простою дорогою П'ятсот верст, а дальшою дорогою ціла тисяча. Once upon a time, before Zoom, before the internet, TV, radio, and printed book, in the evening, people would gather around a fire to listen to stories. With time, the stories grew longer and longer and more and more complex. Music and verse helped the storytellers to remember the best parts. A plucked string instrument like this one here could accompany uh, a voice, but doesn't overwhelm it. Four lyres were found in Mesopotamia near the city of Ur. They are 4,500 years old. They accompanied great stories. One of these stories only survived of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk who lived around 2100 BC and battled a monster. We know about parts of the oldest surviving work of literature from a clay tablet that was uh, written down about 1800 BC or so. The Iliad was about a war between the Greeks and Troy in, in the 12th century BC. It was probably first sung and could have been accompanied by this kind of instrument. The Iliad is traditionally ascribed to the blind singer poet Homer. The written version is from the eighth century BC. This is a picture from the fifth century, a manuscript AD, that is over a thousand years later. Um, Beowulf, the most important work of Old English literature is set in the sixth century Scandinavia. Beowulf is a hero who battles with monsters. One of them is known as Grendel. Beowulf was recited to music and maybe instruments just like these here. A single manuscript was produced around 1000 AD and was almost lost in a fire in 1731. Parts of it you can see are charred and parts of it were made unreadable. The great Norse Edda tell of the beginning of the world of gods and heroes. The poetic Edda were written down in the 13th century, but nothing was known of the, about uh, a manuscript of this until 1643 when it was found by a bishop in Iceland, which is on the very periphery of the Norse speaking world. This is a map of where Old Norse was spoken around 900 AD. You can see the Swedish variant in orange was spoken in the Kiev area and also in the lake areas way up north. 
and it is in these North Lake regions where in 1835, Elias Lundrod found the poems that he compiled to make the Kalevala, the Finnish epics. The Finnish poems were sung and recited to a cantale. And here's a picture of the instrument. And let's listen to a little bit of it. <laughs> So you can imagine telling a story to that instrument. Um, Ivan Sakharov, a Russian folklorist, labeled part of an anthology of folklore he put together as the Berlin, that is, old story. In the middle of the 19th century, Pavel Rybnikov, on the right here, discovered that the Berlin tradition, thought to be extinct, was still flourishing among the peasants of the far north in the lake region. He proceeded to collect hundreds of Berliner there, as did Alexander Guilferding on the left here, who published his work in 1871. To their surprise, many of the songs about the mythical heroes were about medieval Kiev and even Hollage, which are very far from the lake region, the green spot on top. Um, and uh, what were these songs doing so far north in Russia? Surviving on the periphery, just like the Finnish songs of the Kalevala, which actually survived in this very same place, or the Norse Ada that had survived in Iceland. Some of these tales of mythical Bellina also survived in Podilia, but no longer as entire epics and, and songs, but as folk tales. Where they were collected in the 1860s and 50s and 60s by Andriy Deminsky and published in Kiev in 1928 as Kaskieta Opuvidanias Podilia, edited by Mikola Levchenko. One of those stories is labeled a balloon. Here is an illustration of Kirillo Kozumyaka from the Rajivil Chronicle that tells the story briefly as a historical event. But many of us know Kozumyaka as a children's folk tale. I remember a recording from my childhood. Uh, Mikola, Miroslav uh, Diakowski recorded this story accompanying Anna Bandura. He actually built himself. In this recording, the story is introduced. So in this part of the recording, we're going to play. The princess asks the dragon if anyone can defeat him. And the dragon answers. <laughs> Посилали йому дані, давали або молодого парубка, або дівчину. Ото прийшла черга вже й до дочки самого князя. Нічого робити, треба йому давати, а то змі ще піде війною на Київ. Послав князь свою дочку дань змієві. А дочка була така гарна, що й казати не можна. І от змій її полюбив, і живе вона у нього. От раз і питається вона його. Чи є на світі такий чоловік, що в тебе переміг? А змій її відповідає. Є. Живе він у Києві над Дніпром. А такий він, що як розпалить у печі, 
to dim až idem same steleća. A jak vejde na dni proriku, močete koži, škiri, bovinku žunjaka, to me odnune se, a dvanaćać razom. I jak namohnuć vone vodoju v dni pri, to ja vizimu, ka učepljuć za njih, če vetjo ne to vi njih, a jo mu bajduže. Jak posupit, to i mene z njime toliko na berih ne vetja ne. Od toho človika, tiki me ni strašno. So, a real medieval character is at the heart of this story of the strongman Kirillo, the tanner, who can ring 12 hides at once and who has, who has to rescue the daughter of a prince. Probably a real character. And from the dragon, well, probably not a real character, but typical monster in all the old tales from Gilgamesh to Beowulf. So, um, here's um, Diakovsky. He's on the left, our storyteller. And in the center is Zinovich Tokoko. And they are in his studio in the basement in New York, where uh, that Leuko Maestrenko, who's on the left in the headsets, helped him set up. This is where Stokoko will produce the famous basement tapes. And you'll be hearing um, uh, everything you'll hear today uh, from Stokoko are from these tapes. In 1960, Stokoko recorded several Galin in Ukraine, accompanying himself on the Bandura. One of my favorites, if you've been listening to it, is Ilya Murmets. We heard um, the recording at the very top about how he sets off on the journey. Then you'll hear another section. You heard another section after my introduction about how um, after the Battle of Chernihiv, people ask him, um, tell him that nobody's been using the straight road because there's a band called Solovi, that is Nightingale, and he has a devastating whistle. And here's a section about how Ilya first encountered Solovi. Uh, the Ilya takes the straight road to Kiev, which is he has to restore. He has to build bridges and clear the trees. And uh, Solovi sees him and he whistles. А поїхав і саме Бринський, простою дорогою в славний город Київ. І ою рукою коня веде, а ою рукою дуба рве. Самі коренисті та мости мостить, шлях укладає та все прямо їжі. Як під'їхав він до ручки, до самородини. Як побачив його слові розбі. Let's 
Летімо я стріло калена, Вище лісу стоящого, Нижче облака ходящого. А попаді стріло соловію в праве око. Як вилетіла стріла, Ще облака ходящого, а попала солов'ю в праве око, а вилетіла стріла лівим вухом. Упав солов'ї за семи дубі, тоді то Ілія Муровиць то придбав. Соловія розпільникав кайдани кував, До булатного стремена в'язав, Сам простою дорогою у город Київ вирушав. when he whistles and the whole forest chaos is created and Ilya then shoots an arrow into Solovy's right eye which exits out of his ear. He then chains Solovy and leads him to Kiev. Now please help me welcome Julian Katasti, the Bandurist in New York these days. Well hello folks. Hello, hello, how are you? Now, Julian, help me uh, understand something. From our previous series on Ukrainian American cultural figures, we learned about the Kobzari, the blind minstrels in Ukraine. Did the Kobzar sing Belina? Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't sing these songs about medieval Kiev. Uh, they sang uh, a newer, epic style uh, songs which came to be called the Dume. Um, and these are about uh, uh, people and events of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, the time of the Kozaki, the Cossacks. Uh, and uh, we will hear uh, some of those Dumas next month when we hear Stokalka's performances and some others. Uh, in a Duma, uh, 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 in a Duma, Duma session that's going to kick off the, uh, our Epic Songs Festival. Uh, uh, but why not about medieval Kiev? Well, you mentioned the, this idea, which is pretty commonly accepted uh, by scholars of culture that, uh, uh, the cultural um, um, manifestations tend to survive longest uh, on the farthest fringes uh, of a cultural area. You know, just like in American Appalachia in the 20th century, uh, people were finding Elizabethan ballads from England. Um, but the corollary to that is that uh, cultural change happens quickly at the center. Uh, historical events uh, move uh, and things change and populations move and people uh, 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 and that's and what happened um, and that's what happened to the world of the Belene. By 1500 the world of Prince Volodymyr the bright sun was gone. Uh, the north-south trade route from Scandinavia to Byzantium uh, which Kiev uh, controlled and which was the source of Volodymyr's uh, wealth and power uh, had, uh, had long, long ago collapsed. Uh, Byzantium itself was captured by the Turks in 1453, so you had a new empire on the block. 
And the great epic stories of the new time were the struggles on the steppe frontier uh, on, the, on the Black Sea coast and just north of it in Ukraine. Uh, these struggles uh, for control of that frontier. Uh, and the oldest dume come from this time and tell those stories. So where did Stokoko get the text for his Berlin? Well, he, uh, he was a poet himself. And uh, I think he pretty much uh, wrote them. He created them. He, uh, uh, he obviously looked uh, at the Berlin that were collected in the far north. Um, he took the storylines of, uh, in this case, the Belina about Ilya Muromets and, and uh, the siege of Chernihiv and Soloveyi Rozbinik. Um, but, um, uh, but he uh, retold them in a new language and style uh, that incorporated uh, elements of these Ukrainian folk tales like Kirilo Kuzumyaka. Uh, 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 certainly some poetic elements of uh, Dume, uh, and I think a lot of cultural guesswork. And where did the music come from? Uh, the music also is, uh, is Stokalko's, and it draws on all of his sources, all of his work, um, certainly a lot on the music of the Kobzeri, um, also, uh, Stokolko experimented with unusual scales and tunings, and he used, uh, he used that in the Belene. Uh, and he developed an arsenal of Bandura-specific techniques uh, that, that he could use as effects uh, for telling the stories. Um, so let me just uh, adjust my screen here a little bit, and, um, and I'll... Uh, bring the bandura up here and uh, and uh, try to uh, just give a little little sense of what this uh, what some of the stuff we've been listening to might actually look like uh, played on the instrument. Um, uh, Ilya Muromets is actually of the three balena that Stokolko recorded uh, is probably the least radical in terms of its tunings and scales but still he uses uh, two different tunings uh, and uh, creates uh, and with them several creates several different musical worlds. Um, uh, the basic scale in which uh, Ilya Muromets starts and ends is this one. Right, what um, uh, Western musicologists would call harmonic minor. And uh, you know the Kobzeri would uh, just tune and and sing. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I, but he uh, even the scale he doesn't use it quite like in in uh, the in some of the Duma that he plays. He uh, he creates um, he saves uh, this uh, that element. Uh, for later in the Belena, at the beginning, we only hear the we only hear this much of the scale. Uh, this this part with the and you, you hear what a you know, I think per, he's he also he knew his instrument very well. He had a very rich bass sound on his instrument, and he'd learned to use it. And on his Kharkiv style instrument, uh, both hands could go all over the instrument. So, so the, but that's exactly how he starts Ilya Muromets. He starts with the right hand playing on the bass, the left hand playing much higher, which creates a very interesting spatial effect. archaic kind of sound. Uh, I think he was looking for ways to create um, uh, create uh, 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 an old sound. And, um, 
and then uh, when he starts singing, uh, I listened to some of those parts again as we were working on this show. And uh, it really, um, I think uh, for some of the vocal uh, sung parts, he draws on something which uh, would have been uh, uh, part of his sound world uh, since childhood, which is uh, uh, which is old uh, church chant. Um, this uh, this kind of sound with just uh, uh, melodies in a very narrow range, uh, moving by step. Uh, some stuff being recited. Oh, you slavnamohorji umhuramni dauseli da karachayebi. Oi ta salaven molote tilia muromet. That uh, where you have recitation pitches and very short bits of melody in between. Uh, I think it's very much uh, the the sound, whether he used it uh, very consciously or not. But certainly, as a as the son of uh, uh, growing up a priest's kid in uh, in Ukraine, he would have uh, heard a lot of this. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's uh, music that does go back. Um, uh, some of the melodies do go back uh, to the time of medieval Kiev. So, um, so that's uh, that's one one aspect of it. And then um, he saves, as I say, the the other part of the scale. And, off, and uh, uses it sometimes all the way up here as a single note melody. And sometimes here. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, creating this uh, sense of something old, also something maybe wild so the the duma is set in the wilderness in this uh, in this place where um, in this place where you find uh, semi monsters like Solovy the bandit and of course the uh, in those encounters with Solovy uh, that's where Sokolko could really use some of the effects that he developed on the bandura uh, like there's uh, just and again, because you can use both hands on the instrument, he used an immense amount of glis different glissandos uh, to create the sound of, the, of that duel with Solovy. He could play it with the right hand, with the left hand. He could play it with the back of the nail. He could play it with the thumb. He could play it with the back of the thumb. He could play it damp. He could play it below the bridge. And, and uh, listening to those few seconds of music from the, from the battle with Solovy, uh, uh, all of those things are in there, and uh, and that's uh, that's what he makes it from. Uh, so, uh, uh, in um, in the in the next part of the of Ilya Muromets, uh, after the the fight with uh, with Solovy, um, uh, the story moves uh, into Prince Volodymyr's cave. And Stokolka here retunes like I just did. Uh, he had the same kind of levers on his bandura. And now he has uh, really a pretty standard white key scale. And, uh, and again, I think this kind of underlined, uh, the music changes at that point. He starts using chords a little bit more in the first part. Uh, he was trying, uh, I think, consciously avoiding using uh, standard chords very much. Uh, and, um, uh, but here he, uh, here you start hearing a different kind of music and it uh, underlines this picture of uh, Kiev as this uh, kind of island of civilization in this wilderness uh, where, you know, they were trying to, you know, basically hack, uh, hack out a little clearing of civilization with an ax. Uh, quite literally, and uh, and where you could still find uh, 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 Solovy Rosbinik lurking just just around the next bend in the road, uh, but uh, but in Kiev, uh, Ilya rides into Kiev to this uh, kind of courtly melody. But it 
ends like that, just to, I guess, remind you that uh, Solovy Rosbinik is still tagging along and we're not done with Solovy just yet. Uh, so, and the prince asks Ilya um, some questions like, right, where are you from? Uh, what clan, what tribe, and most importantly, what road did you take coming to Kiev? And let's listen to Stokoko. Hvori tu ni knjaz Volodimir Stolno Kijevski. A jakoju dobrimu moče dorovju ti jiha u Stolni i horod Kijev? Prijamo jižoju či u kružnoju? Promovit Ilija Murovic taki slova. Sjohodni rano z ritnim batjkom nenjihoju praščavsja. A poludne hotilось мені у тебе правувати, та приучилось мені три причині, що перша причина Чернігів город від облоги виручати, що друга причина на п'ятнадцять верст мости через річку Самородину мостити. То вже третя причина Соловія розбійника всі мог дубів збивати У город Київ приважати Тобі князю гостинця дарувати Так уже прямою дорогою приїхав я із города Муром Я основний Київ город князю So Ilya answers by the straight road. I have brought you Solovy also to prove it. Um, so now let's welcome Marko Robert Steck from Toronto, where he works for the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. So oh. hi, <laughs> good to have you. Uh, how did you become interested in Stockholm and the Berlin? Uh, there were two stories that later got converged into one. I first got interested in Stokolko, and not as a Bandura player, not as a Bandura virtuoso, although I knew about him as a Bandura virtuoso, but as a modernist poet, very radically modernist poet. Uh, he um, functioned in this, in this capacity in the late 1940s in Germany. Um, after World War II, uh, in uh, the American and British uh, zones in Germany, in the displaced persons camps, uh, um, there were many Ukrainian refugees. And actually, in these three, four years after the war, they developed a fantastically interesting cultural life there. And uh, probably the most um, radically modernist group was led by uh, a, a writer whom I studied for many, many years, Igor Kostetsky. And Stokolko, under the pseudonym Zinovi Berezhan, was part of that group. Actually, another new, a, a future New Yorker was a member of this group, a painter, an expressionist painter, Yuri Slovi. So I, I got to Stokolko um, as a poet as, and as a writer, and I did not have an idea that he ever sang any Berliner. Quite separately, I got interested in, in the old Ukrainian epos, and uh, nightly epos such as Slovo Polku Yorovi, uh, such, a, such as uh, various fragments that survived in, in the topis, in, in the chronicles. In some, some cases, uh, folk uh, tales, heroic tales like Kozumiaka, and of course, Belinda. And I was always fascinated by the fact that you mentioned, uh, Vilana, how is it that in the far north of Russia, the stories, the Belinda that survived there until the 19th century, basically, mostly, almost exclusively speak about Ukraine. 
there is a small Novgorod cycle which speaks about northern uh, lands, but but basically it is Kiev, Chernihiv, and very often Halic, which is totally in the west of Ukraine and very very far away, over two thousand two and a half thousand kilometers away from these places. And my question, of course, was how did they get there, and how did they survive there? And um, and during my research of this question, I I, I, um, I uh, found a book by Valery Shevchuk, a um, very prominent Ukrainian writer, but also a very, very prominent researcher of Ukrainian old literature. And he wrote a book called Mislenne Derevo, which is uh, a tree of thoughts. And in, a, in this book, he actually presented a very, very compelling and very well-grounded uh, hypothesis that Belene, which are very different from both the knightly poetry and the folk tales, uh, totally different uh, uh, genre of their own, were created and sung by merchants. That merchants were traveling to far away uh, places, they were staying there for long times with their caravans, and then they were actually dis disseminating this, this epos throughout the entire era. And we know, uh, if, if actually, as early as 10th century, we have a fascinating story by an Arab geographer, Al Masudi, who is describing the, the uh, Rus uh, merchant caravan. And among other things, he describes how they every evening sing epic uh, uh, sort of song, ep uh, epic poetry, and play on the husli, the sort of plucked uh, um, string instrument. So, and later, and I was always, of course, fascinated, have, because I was sure that the, the, the songs themselves, the original songs originated in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Chernihiv, in, in Halic, and told these stories and were later disseminated. And I was always fascinated by the fact, have they actually survived any Ukrainian language? stories in spite of what, what uh, Julian was saying that uh, really is, times changed and, and the new epic almost totally uh, pushed out the, the old epic. And as you, as you said, Virlana, the, the story survived quite, quite well about Ilya Muromets, but as fairy tales. But in, 19, in the late 1980s, the same Valery Shevchuk discovered a book published that you mentioned, published in the 1920s, based on the ethnographic research done in mid 19th century in Podila. And in it, among the various tales and fairy tales, he actually found what was written as a fairy tale, but is actually a Belina, a Ukrainian language Belina. And it's about Ilya Muromets. He actually found three such ones that he managed to simply break up into stanzas, break up into the poetic form, and we have an actual Ukrainian, three actual Ukrainian Belinas. And what is fascinating about one of them, and it is about Ilya Muromets, is that it tells the entire story of Ilya Muromets, of all of his life and all of his adventures. None of the Russian northern Belinas tell the entire story. And by the way, neither does Stokolko's version. I do agree with Julian that Stokolka wrote his own Belina, that he took as an example a Russian Belina, which is fragmentary. And uh, as, you, as, you, as you know, as, you, as we heard, the Belina, Stokolka's Belina, starts when he leaves home and says farewell to his father and mother, and he goes to Kiev. Well, the, the Ukrainian Belina is quite different. It starts with the fact that he is it's a, he is this giant who is paralyzed, who until the year, uh, 30th year of his life cannot get up out of bed. And only then is magically healed and becomes uh, the hero, a bohater. And, and then he has all sorts of other, um, other adventures and, and, and so on, including, of course, the Solvi adventure. But it's not by far not the only one. And what is also different about Ukrainian Dumas uh, and the Duma, the Russian Dumas and, and uh, uh, Duma that, that is presented here by, by Stokolko is geography. 
that it, it is, uh, we, we probably will have a chance to still to talk about it, but, but it is a, a completely different geographic take. There is no saving of Chernihiv in the Ukrainian Duma, uh, Belina, for example, because um, uh, in, in the Ukrainian Duma, uh, Ilya Muromets is not from Murom, from, from the northern parts, but, but from, from, uh, from other parts, from the U Ukrainian parts. So do you think that Ilya Muromets is based on a real person? Uh, well, I not only think that, uh, or, or let's say it this way, I, I'm not the only one who thinks that. I mean, there is a very old tradition in uh, the Kiev cave monastery, Kiev Opacherska Lavra. There is a body uh, of a saint uh, canonized in the 16th century, Prepodobny Illa, the Saint Illa. And he was for many, many, many centuries associated with Ilya Muromets. And um, uh, he uh, is one of, the, one of the monks whose mummy is his, whose tomb is in, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the caves of the cave, uh, Pecharska Lavra. And uh, what I was fascinating is that uh, well for in in the 19 in the 16th 17th century many of the western travelers to Kiev describe the the kind of veneration of this particular mummy and the association of him with the um, hero warrior from the from the Rus time and even sometimes i think that the the name of of uh, muromets is or murin is uh, mentioned but but it's primarily the the hero of, of that time and what is fascinating about him that uh, about this uh, um, mummy is that in 1988 a scientific uh, commission was established and this mummy was actually examined for three years it was it was tested for various things and, uh, and of course sort of an autopsy was made it's uh, by the way it's very well preserved naturally very well preserved and so uh, it turned out first and foremost that it was not a monk that this person was died in battle it was it, that it was a warrior with many broken bones with many many uh sort of battle battle wounds uh, that he died in ba uh, in battle by through sort of was hit through the heart with a, with, a, with a sword and that's uh, also what was uh, that he was very large and strong uh, I mean, comparatively speaking, some 15 centimeters higher than the average of, of the time. And what is most fascinating about the story, it's, uh, to the, to, with the uh, connection to the story of Ilya Muromets, is that they found in his bones uh, the traces of a particular immune uh, disease. I, I, I have a problem pronouncing it. Let me try to pronounce it properly. It's called spondyloarthrosis, and it is a kind of arthritis, arthritis of, the, of the spine, which makes you paralyzed, which makes your leg paralyzed, you cannot walk. But at the same time, they found the, that later in life, there, there is a tissue that was obviously recovered, that, that he actually got over the, this, this uh, particular illness. So the story about him being paralyzed and then later becoming active was actually corroborated. So as far as the, uh, the scientific, um, um, this, uh, scientific uh, sort of uh, testing uh, goes, uh, he lived not under uh, Prince Volodymyr, neither Prince Volodymyr the Great nor Prince Volodymyr Monomach. Uh, Prince Volodymyr the Great lived in uh, the sort of uh, end of uh, 10th, beginning of, uh, end, end of 11th and beginning of uh, sorry, end of 10th and uh, beginning of 11th century. Volodymyr Monomach lived at the end of 11th, beginning of 12th century. Ilya Muromets, the, the one who, whose tomb we have pres uh, preserved in the Lavra, lived a, a hundred years later at the end of uh, sort of uh, 12th, uh, 12th century. And he apparently, we suspect that he most probably died because he did become a monk uh, according to legend at some point but and he actually even swore not to ever take up a sword but when 
in 1203, there was a massive attack by the Cumans on Kiev, uh, instigated by the infighting between two, two princes of Kiev, and there was a massive de destruction of, of the city, and the uh, monastery was directly attacked, and they suspect that this was the time when, when Ilya Mor Muromets uh, forgot about his oath and actually took up a sword to defend the monastery, but died. At, at this time. So, so we very, very possibly, we do have a prototype for the story. Of course, all of the other adventures that are in the, in the tale are fantastic, but, but we might, may have uh, the prototype. And, and I, I will then uh, come back to the question of geography. It is uh, widely assumed by Russian scholars that Ilya Muromets is the Ilya from Murom. And this is also what, what um, uh, um, Stockholm says as well, which is very, very far, far north, 1,500 kilometers away. From non, this is not yet that, uh, 1,500 kilometers away uh, in, in Russia. But in the Ukrainian tradition, it's a completely different story. Uh, 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 Ilya Muromets goes to Kiev not through Chernihiv and not through the Bryansk forests, but he walks one day. And because of that, we, we focus on the city of Morivsk, uh, on, the, on the town of Morivsk, yes, that's, that's right here, which in the old times was called Muromsk, which in the Kievan, towns of Kievan Rus was called Muromsk. In the area of Muromsk, all of the toponyms are very, very similar to the ones used by Bereza Kavarchayevo and, and, and so on, uh, very much uh, to the ones used in the... And also, if, if one, on his way to Kiev, he passes this, what is today is Alicia National Park, which is right there, which is very likely the place, the, site, the sort of remnants of that forest, the, the, the very dense forest in which the Rosvinik Solovyi the, the bandit Solvi was was um, whatever this uh, this sort of mm, collective name means um, it, it was sitting most probably it was it was some some sort of uh, sort of uh, robbers and bandits who were who were at that time as Julian said uh, uh, quite active on the periphery of the of big cities so uh, um, it, it's a fascinating story. Um, for me, the finding of Ukrainian Berlin with the with a different geography and with the entire story of Ilya Muromets shows that uh, the, this is an older version. This is the version closer to the original. Uh, as uh, things, as Epos becomes disseminated further and further away to un unfamiliar territories, they get fra the, it has a tendency to get fragmented. The stories get broken up into smaller units. This is what happened with Russian Belinas. The Ukrainian Belina is actually complete, full. And uh, to me, it was, it was basically a discovery of the century as far as old, old Ukrainian epoch, uh, epos and, and the Belinas specifically was concerned. So now let's hear how the prince and his court go to watch Solovy, which um, whistle. That's the thing they really want to do. And uh, Ilya warns them and, that it's quite dangerous, and then he commands Solovy to do it only half strength. Володимир Стольнокиївський зі своїми князями та боярами виходили вони на широкий двір подивитись на Соловія розбійника. Говорить Володимир князь. Ой ти, Соловію розбійнику, засвищити по Соловійну, закричити по звірину. Засичити по сміїну. Говорить йому Соловій розбійник. Ой, к 
князів Володимир Стойлокнивський. Не твій я слуга, не у тебе хліб сир їв, та зелен вино пив. Не обій мені розказувати. Мовив Ілья Муромець, засвищи соловію та напів свисту, закричи ті та напів крику. Говорить соловій розбійник, запечатались мої кроваві рани, налийте мені чару вина зелено. Зелен вина на півтора ведра. Випив соловій чару зелен вина. Як засмище соловій на цілий зміст, Як закричить на повен крик, Як зашипить на повен крик, Листя з дерев посипалось, А у князя з теремів Високих крижі зривало. Всі хрустальні віконця Повипадали. По всьому городу, по Києву Всі бременні ковели ожеребились. Yes, so, of course, Solovy can't resist and whistles and creates great chaos in Kiev. All the roofs fly off, the nobles are all flying through the air, and even all the horses are, are the, the mares are foul. Um, so, Juliet, was Stokoka the only Bandurus who sang this Belina? Julian? Uh, we can't hear you. Um, I think now you can, yes? Yes. <laughs> Good. Good help around the microphone. But uh, for a long time, um, uh, no one else did anything with them. Uh, very few people heard them, uh, really, because uh, uh, Stokoko's version of it uh, on the recordings, because those were basement tapes uh, that weren't uh, widely available. And it was a, something that Stokoko had never really finished. Those, uh, the Belina are really drafts. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so for a long time, uh, they pretty much sat there and, and on, on the tapes. Uh, a few people knew about them, but then Levko Maestrenko certainly tried to tell people about them. But, uh, uh, you know, it was, if anyone had heard them, they, you know, they weren't. Uh, they weren't Bandurist who were interested, you know, who would have tried to do it. But um, uh, one year in the early 90s, uh, I was teaching a, a, a group of advanced students at a Bandura camp. Um, and um, one of the students was uh, Mike Andretz, who became my very good friend and colleague. Um, and, you know, the group was about here. And Mike was out there somewhere, so he was just bored silly in the group. Uh, and after a few days, uh, uh, I just didn't know what else to give him. So, so I gave him the Stokoko recording, uh, Ilya Muromets, and said, well, here, Mike, this is kind of cool. Listen, listen to this and try to, try to figure it out and transcribe it. And he did. Uh, so he had part of it done uh, by the end of the camp. And then later he finished. Uh, a transcription of all of Ilya Muromets and he did learn it and performed it. So he was the, as far as I know, the next one uh, after Stokoko. And then uh, some years after that, 
uh, I was uh, I was at the same camp. I was the music director for, uh, for a while, and uh, and I uh, um, I really wanted uh, uh, I wanted to let all of our students experience uh, uh, this music, uh, learn about Belene and um, and about Stockelka. Uh, so I used uh, Mike's uh, transcription and from that made an ensemble arrangement. Um, uh, so, so all of them could, uh, could experience it. Uh, so, uh, and it's, uh, this is what we're going to hear. Uh, this is uh, the performance we're going to hear of the uh, final bit of the Belena. Uh, <clears throat> Ilya, uh, in all this chaos in Kiev City, Ilya Muromets asks Solovy, why didn't you obey my order? I told you half whistle, half roar. Uh, and Solovy answers uh, defiantly, just about everything he says in the Belena is pretty defiant. And he says, I, I know my end is near. So I gave a full whistle, a full roar, a full hiss. And uh, Ilya, at that, takes him off, takes him away to the place of punishment. And this was the end of Solovy the Bandit. But Ilya's story is sung in all the lands, all the tribes, and even by our happy campers uh, on a hillside over the Allegheny River in 2005. Uh, I'm the narrator and Mike Andretz conducts. Darian? Yes? Uh, we can't hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, we still can't hear it. No. We'll yeah. have to imagine it. Oh, well, no, no, no. Maybe I have a copy here. No. Oh, here it is. No. Uh, 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 open file. Hold on. Uh -oh. Can you hear it from me? Uh, Darian? No, I cannot. Okay, uh, let me share the screen then and I'll play it, okay? I don't know, I think. You can share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> okay, because I have this and it should be here because I just tried playing it and it was there. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Oh, no. Once you're looking for it, I will tell you just a little bit about okay, the story. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, it, what we hear in this Belina, it's roughly one-fifth uh, of what the Ukrainian full Ilya Muromets Belina is, is about. There is a very fascinating also another story after uh, after after this happens, because this is only the initial sort of test for for Ilya Muromets. He is uh, later he gets married, and there is a very sort of fascinating story about he has a son who is almost as strong as him, 
and uh, he um, goes on, the, on, on a number of uh, various adventures and the main adventure ends up in such a way that he, he fights his own son whom he doesn't recognize and he almost kills him. And uh, the, it's, it's almost this Greek tragedy element to this story. It, it's really a fascinating um, idea. And in, in the Russian uh, Dumas, you don't have, the, uh, Belinas, you don't have that part of the story. In general, you have only very fragmentary elements. And, and the fact that there is so much more of the story in the Ukrainian Belina is, again, tells me that this is, this is the uh, closer to the original. And of course, the original Belinas were neither the Ukrainian ones nor the Russian ones. They were in slightly different language, language of that time. It is like all thing, all uh, epos that is uh, um, sort of uh, goes from generation to generation. It changes with each singer. It changes with each generation. Uh, it becomes more, much more, it gets the color of a local language, local dialect. Mm. For mm. example, the Ukrainian Belina is very much in the Podilian dialect. But what I also wanted to say is just simply, unless you already found the, found the tape. Then I don't I can... know. Darian, have you found the tape? Or not? No, because it's still. It's, it's not. Still then I will do it, OK? I think I have it. If you uh, let me share the screen, yes. Uh, I think you have to allow me to share the screen. Uh, Darian, can you un? Yeah. Okay. Great. Try now. Okay. And I think then I can. Ah. Can you hear it now? No. No. No, we can't. Okay. Oops. You cannot hear it. No. No. Okay. Okay. Just let me try one other thing. Uh, 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 uh. No. Share. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. No, I can't do it. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, great. So why don't we go on? I'm sorry, Julian, we can't seem to get the tape to play. Um, so, uh, do, uh, do we want the uh, uh, ending live? Sure. Will you play for us? Can you? That would be fabulous. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Mm. Так не стало соловія розбійника на святій Русі. Тут по славному козаку і люмуромцю славу співають по всім землям, по всім ордам. Od nyní do víka, a vám na mnohí líta. Well, Julian, thank you for rescuing us. Um, if you enjoyed our event today, um, you'll be glad to know there's more to come. So Julian, can you tell us about what we're going to do next? Well, we heard a little bit uh, today about uh, Stokolko, um, about uh, Stokolko, uh, the poet. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll find out a little bit more about that aspect of him. And in general, about, about him as a person and his life in New York in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and uh, towards the end, um, uh, towards in the in the last uh, uh, in his last creative uh, work with the bandura, which included the belene, um, 
Stokelko also did some experimental Bandura pieces. And we're going to hear some of those from the tapes. And we're going to hear uh, uh, some of the music by, uh, uh, by a later group of New York Bandura, Bandurists uh, that was inspired by those pieces. OK, great. So um, Stokoko was obviously a person who not only preserved Ukrainian epic tradition, but also really developed it, um, as does a lot of our diaspora. So friends, if you have uh, pictures of Ukrainian cultural events in America, or have personal stories, et cetera, drop us a line uh, at Yara Arts Group. Uh, at gmail.com. And uh, also, um, uh, now let's hear it for Julian Katasti and for Mark Koster and our visual designer, Valdemar Klusko. And thank you, Darian, for running our tech today. Give us a wave. It was an exciting time today <laughs> with unexpected difficulties. Um, and a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, New York State Council on the Arts, Bandura Downtown, and all the friends of Yara Arts Group. Uh, we rely on your support and you gotta stay healthy. Uh, we have a theater program with today, uh, for today's event. You can download it and uh, tell your friends about our event. And you can also listen to all the, rec uh, the recordings of our past events on our website. Um, our exit music will be a surprise guest from Ukraine, a young Bandura player who's taking the first uh, steps to, uh, down the path of telling and singing tales. She's from Vinnytsia, and she's a student of Mitra Hubiak and Marina Zaliziak. She learned to play Bandura Kharkiv style from the very beginning. And the tune she will be playing was arranged by Khodkevich of a Honcharenko Kozachok. She is 12 years old, and her name is Safika Al Hadidi. Thank you and good night. Good night.